Welcome to chapter 23, which is the urinary system. We're going to learn how you take the toxic substances out of the plasma and turn them into urine that you excrete from your body. So the kidneys and the urinary system do all sorts of things, but they also do things that we don't really think about, like regulate your blood volume, regulate your blood pressure, um, determine the makeup of your blood, what's in the plasma, what do you keep, what do you get rid of. So it's a little bit more complicated than just drinking a glass of water and then going and peeing. Uh, the, some books call this the urogenital system instead of just the urinary system because it's really hard to separate the two uh, from each other. The reproductive system is intimately connected to the excretory system. Uh, example of that would be a man can either ejaculate sperm or he can urinate, but he doesn't do both at the same time. But if he tries to, a lot of times the sperm go up into the bladder instead of out. So one of the more interesting things that uh, your plumbing can do. We're going to learn about the different organs of the urinary system, and there's not very many, so it's going to be pretty easy. And then we're going to learn how the kidneys make urine. That's very complicated. So we'll spend the majority of our time talking about that. And then we're going to talk about nitrogenous waste and where they come from. Well, I'll give you a clue about that. They mostly come from the breakdown of amino acids. But anyway, uh, and we're going to talk about excretion. How do you excrete? How do you get rid of waste? Now, one of the more interesting things about the nitrogen waste most people that aren't killed by getting hit by a car or a meteor lands on them or something like that, the people who die in the hospital, they generally die from a buildup of nitrogen waste in their bloodstream. So you can actually figure out about when a person is going to pass. So it always seemed like a, a mysterious thing when the doctor would come in and say, all right, you need to call the family members in because grandma's going to be dead in about 23 hours. And you're like, how do you know that? How can you tell that? Well, because they're monitoring your blood and they're looking at the buildup of nitrogen waste. So if we were to put down on death certificates, the cause of death was a buildup of nitrogenous waste, it would be easily the number one killer. But we don't do that. We say that the person was sick with something, and then what finally got them was the nitrogenous waste. So we don't even put that on the death certificate. Most people are really surprised to find out where their kidneys are. They're around towards the back. And uh, so most people uh, assume that they're kind of in the middle or around their waist or something like that, which is one of the reasons in boxing they don't let you reach around and do a kidney punch in the back because the kidneys are very fragile. So they're protected. They sit in a little pocket of fat, which they've taken away in this picture so that you can see the shape of the kidneys. But there's a great big pocket of fat that cushions this. And then coming out of each kidney is a ureter, and then we have a bladder, and then you have the urethra. So the, like I said, the, the parts and the plumbing are not that difficult. A girl has a much shorter urethra than a guy, so girls are going to be getting um, bladder infections and kidney infections at a much higher rate than guys. Also, it seems like on a trip, a man can go a lot longer before he has to go to the bathroom than a woman. So here's a list of some of the things that your kidneys do besides filtering your blood and excreting toxic waste. And I said the blood volume is regulated. So if you need to keep your blood volume up, you just don't pee out as much. And if you have too much volume, then you can pee it out. It, by doing this, you regulate how much pressure there is. And the osmolarity, excuse me, osmolarity, 
osmolarity of this. So we talked about osmosis, and I'll, I'll go over osmosis again when we get into the filtration part, because you must understand osmosis, or you want to understand how the kidneys work. You also regulate the amount of sodium and potassium you have, your electrolytes, and it also changes the pH of your, of your body, of your blood, so your acid-base balance, your pH. The kidneys can secrete a hormone which stimulates the production of red blood cells. So if the kidneys realize there's not enough red blood cells, it'll make this um, hormone, and then you will start making more red blood cells. You also help regulate your calcium levels. So your bones are constantly remodeling. So some of the calcium is going out, some of the calcium is going back in. And the kidneys will help with uh, the calcitrol synthesis. Another thing is we talked about uh, hormones when we did the chapter on the endocrine system. And how do you stop hormones? You, do they just keep going and going and going? No, you can actually pee them out. So you can look at uh, a urine sample and see which hormones come out. Now here's an interesting fact for those who um, have hormone, or ladies who have hormone replacement. They take the urine from pregnant mares, pregnant horses, and they get the uh, estrogen out of that and they make it into a pill form and that's the pill that women take who need estrogen so you're you're just taking a little bit of horse pee so that's kind of a interesting thing and then um, detoxifying free radicals so when things break down sometimes they get ionized and if you have ionized substances that besides, you know, you need sodium potassium to be ionized. But a lot of the other uh, substances, you do not want them to be in an ionic form because it can damage your DNA, it can damage your cells. So you need to detoxify these free radicals. So the kidneys can also help in that. And then in starvation, if you're starving to death, you can turn amino acids into glucose. So the kidneys do a lot more than just make pee. Some of the things that you pee out are, uh, oh, some of that marijuana you smoked. So that comes out in your urine. That's why they do the little urine test. Um, some of the uh, drugs that you take, they break down and they are present in your urine. Uh, people who have diabetes, they have way too much uh, sugar, and they're unable to pull it into the cells, they're unable to use it all, so it spills out into their urine. So normally, people do not urinate, or they do not get rid of their glucose. They keep it and they use it. But in the case of a diabetic, you can take a urine sample and you can see the sugar coming out in their urine. So in theirs, it is either useless to the body because they don't have insulin to pull it into the cells, or it's present in way more than you need. So there's all sorts of things. When you take any medicine, whether it's um, uh, prescribed over the counter or a street drug, you will break it down and pee out bits and pieces of it. When you're breaking down proteins into amino acids and you're breaking down the amino acids into ammonia, then you've got to remove the ammonia because if it builds up in your bloodstream, it will kill you. Two common chemicals that you're going to see coming out in the urine are uric acid, and that's where you are breaking down nucleic acids. Remember when you see the word cat? you're breaking down something. Think of a cat clawing up your, your uh, couch or your favorite chair. And then creatinine, this is one of the things they look at. They look at your creatinine and they look at the urea nitrogen that's in your um, uh, blood to see whether or not your kidneys are working. So you take creatine phosphate and you break it down, catabolism, and make creatinine. Creatine becomes creatinine. And 
the bun level is one of the first tests they're going to do. It's a very simple blood test. They just look at it, and they look at your bun level, and they say, ah, okay, you're getting rid of nitrogen waste just fine, or you're not. So if you have an elevated bun, you have more than 20 milligrams per deciliter, the word for elevated bun is azotemia. Azotemia. This is too much nitrogen. And if you have uremia, you're going to have diarrhea and vomiting, you have trouble breathing, your heart may become uh, beating irregularly, arrhythmia. You might have AFib. And this is because of the toxic waste, the toxic nitrogen waste. So if you don't have hemodialysis, meaning they literally take your blood out of your body and run it through a machine to get through the, rid of the waste, since your kidneys cannot do it for some reason, or they actually have to give you a kidney transplant. So here are four major nitrogenous wastes. Urea, with urine, uric acid, creatinine, and ammonia. So you've got to get these out of your body. So I'd like you all to go out and get in your car in your mind and look at the windshield and there's frequently big white blobs of bird droppings on your windshield. You're looking at the nitrogen waste of a bird. Birds have to be very good about holding water because they, they migrate, they go places, they have to go without water for a while. So they have evolved into making such thick urine that it actually comes out as that white paste. And actually the uh, people go out and mine the this white paste, this, this urine, um, in like say bat guano. You go in where the bats roosting and they poop on the ground, they make just huge big piles of it. And you can scoop it up and you can use it for fertilizer. Or one of the more interesting things uh, that a lot of people don't realize, uh, unless you, um, look at certain websites, is the nitrogen is explosive. So uh, nitrogen fertilizers have been used in bombings. So who knew? It's really dangerous. Excretion isn't just done by the kidneys. You have studied about getting rid of gases like CO2 in the respiratory system, so that's considered excretion. Your sweat, where you have the sodium and the potassium, lactic acid, urea, all this in your sweat. So that's one way that you can get rid of um, waste that you don't need in your body. Uh, the digestive system gets rid of a lot of stuff. Your, your breakdown of your fats, it gets rid of bile, uh, cholesterol, other metabolic waste as well as CO2 and salts and, of course, water. And then your urinary system, metabolic waste, where you break things down and get rid of toxic substances, ammonia, drugs, hormones that you don't need anymore, uh, excess salt. You actually have your urine is going to be acidic because you get rid of hydrogen ions. And if you remember, acid is... a uh, excess of hydrogen ions. Most people are surprised to find out the size of the kidney. It's about the size of a bar of soap, so it's not as big as most people think. And the heart is always a surprise when people uh, find out that their heart's about the size of their fist. They're just amazed at that. But anyway, uh, you have coverings and protections for your kidney. So it is attached to the abdominal wall by the renal fascia. And then I talked about the fat capsule that the kidney sits in and it cushions it and holds it in place. And then the fibrous capsule covers the kidney and 
protects it a little bit from trauma. Not if you're boxing and you're fighting, then it can't protect it from that. But from just bumping into a doorknob or things like that, uh, it'll help you with that. It also helps keep infection out. And the collagen fibers from this fibrous capsule extend out into the renal fascia. So it helps anchor it to the, to the uh, renal fascia, to the peritoneum. I'm coming back to the picture showing you your kidneys. And you'll notice that one is a little bit lower than the other one. That's because the liver is pushing it down. And if you look, here's the kidney and here is the ureter coming down to the bladder. Now, because it's sitting in a pocket of fat, it keeps this unkinked. So the fluid can run out of the kidney and down and into the bladder. But if you suddenly lose weight, maybe you have cancer, maybe you're on one of those weird diets where you lose too much weight, your kidney will drop because there's no fat pocket in there, and it can actually put a kink in this ureter. And we call that atosis, and it's spelled P-T-O-S-I-S, -S, or a dropping. So... When you have a weird reading from your urine, it, it, one of the first things they do is go, oh, your kidneys aren't working correctly. Well, your kidneys may be working just fine, but if you've got a kink in this tube right there, or you can get a kink in the urethra, but that's pretty rare, um, then you're not going to be able to pass the urine out. So you're making urine just fine, but you can't get it down to the bladder because you have a kink in your ureter. So it's important to uh, check and see why you have a, a weird urinalysis reading or your blood is indicating that your kidneys aren't working correctly because it may not be the problem with the kidneys at all. In lab, we went down uh, into the kidney and talked about how the renal artery branches off into the interloper arteries, and that branches off into the arcuate arteries, which branches off into the cortical radiate arteries, and eventually it branches off into the afferent arterioles. So this is only showing you the renal artery, and they're not naming all the branches as you go into the various lobes of the kidney. If you've been paying attention as we've gone through the various chapters in this book, you'll find that they take a lot of the organs, and they have the outer level that they call the cork layer or the cortex. So it's the outer layer, and we did this with the adrenals. And then in the inside, you have the medulla. Medulla is middle. And this is going to be super, super important in the kidneys because we need to know what's happening in the cortex and what's happening in the medulla. So we'll get into that. When you come out of each of these medullas, and they call them pyramids, this one really looks like a pyramid. This one not so much. So depending on where you are, uh, it looks more or less like a pyramid. You come out into what we call the minor calyx, which flows into the major calyx, which comes on down. And eventually, you're going to pass out through the ureter. So you're, you're collecting the urine that's formed from each of these pyramids or of the medulla. I forgot to mention that the minor calyces and the major calyces drain into a renal pelvis right there. Now, you've probably heard of kidney stones. If you get a kidney stone that blocks your ureter, you can't pass urine. So it's really important to stay hydrated 
and not let these kidney stones build up. And if you have a tendency to have kidney stones in your family, then your chances of getting kidney stones is higher than other people. Behind the renal pelvis, you have the renal sinus. So here is a kind of, a, remember sinuses are kind of open areas, like you have sinuses in your uh, behind your nose, behind your cheekbones. So you have sinuses various places. But these particular sinuses in your kidneys are going to have your blood vessels, your nerves, and some lymphatic vessels in there also. So you not only have a fat pocket that holds the kidney up and prevents ptosis, but you also have adipose tissue or fat filling up the remaining part of the kidney besides the uh, cortex and the medulla, the sinuses, and the uh, pelvis. Here's the same thing we were looking at. Uh, only we were looking at an autopsy kidney, and this is the cartoon version. So it's easier to see the pyramids of the medulla and the cortex out here. And, of course, they've colorized the uh, renal artery and the renal vein. And then they show the uh, renal pelvis that everybody drains into, coming into the renal pelvis. And see how much larger this is than the ureter. So you can see how easily that a kidney stone, if it built up in here, wouldn't be able to uh, allow things to go through if it got caught right there. It's also easier to see on this the renal columns. So if you have a pyramid like this, then you're going to have to have an area like this where the cortex comes down in and we call those the uh, renal columns right there so there's your renal columns in between the pyramids you would think that the blood coming out of the heart would go equally to all parts of the body but almost a fourth of everything coming out of the heart runs over to the kidneys so that it can be cleaned up before it goes on Coming into the uh, kidneys, you have your renal artery. So the artery is coming in, and it branches off in those renal columns that we saw that are between the pyramids. When this branches off, we now call them interlobar lo uh, arteries, between the lobes, interlobar arteries. And then they branch out into the arcuate arteries, and they're around your pyramids. And then the cortical radiate arteries radiate up into the cortex. So that's kind of how they got their name. Now, once you get up in the cortex, that's where all the interesting stuff starts happening. Because that's where you're going to find the, the mechanism that actually filters the blood. So you're going to branch into afferent arterioles. So remember that word, afferent arterioles. And this is going to go into a nephron. So we will spend at least a half of our talk just talking about nephrons. So they're that important. So you have a wad of capillaries. So arterioles branch off into this wad or ball of capillaries, which we call the glomerulus glomerulus. Once the glomerulus has done its thing and filtered the plasma, we're going to send the filtered plasma back by efferent arterioles, and you're going to paratubular capillaries, so around the tubular uh, capillaries, and you also have a vasa recta. So if you remember Things that have thick uh, muscles or thick areas have to have their own network of blood vessels just to take care of the uh, blood vessels that are there. So you say, what? What, what, what is she talking about? The, some of the blood vessels are so thick that you actually have to have blood vessels feeding the blood vessels. So 
This is going to be the vasa recta. We're going to talk about that, a network of blood vessels within the uh, renal medulla. So uh, these are foreshadowings of things that we're going to talk about in more uh, detail. So you got it coming in basically through the renal artery. You're going to get it over to this glomerulus, which we're going to find out what that is and why it's so incredibly important. And then it's going to come out from the efferent arterioles. So it comes in by afferent arterioles and leaves by efferent arterioles. So be careful, just the E and the A are a little bit different there. All right, so we're going to eventually go to the renal vein and the renal vein is gonna dump into the inferior vena cava. And so we're gonna start the whole process again. For those of you who like nice little flow charts, here's a nice flow chart flowing out of the heart through the aorta, eventually coming to the renal artery, the segmental artery, the interlobar artery, the arcuate, and the cortical radiate. Now I'm going to stop right here because in your lab manual they made a mistake and they have it coming from the interlobar to the arcuate and back to the interlobar and then to the afferent and they completely left out the cortical radiate. So is it error in your book? It's on page uh, 84. So I just thought I'd point that little problem out there. All right, there's that afferent arterial that's going to go into this glomerulus, and it's going to exit by the efferent arterial. So it's kind of nice when you have it in a flow sheet that you can see this. Now, some of this is going to go to the vasa recta, which is going to nourish these. And then some of it will go through the paratubular capillaries, through the cortical radiate veins, ooh, arteries, veins, arcuate artery, arcuate vein, interlobar artery, interlobar vein. Oh, look at that. And then the renal vein. So it's not as much to learn as you thought it was. And then to the inferior vena cava and back into the heart. I do think it's interesting that they're nattering on about paratubular capillaries and nephron loops and proximal distal convoluted tubules and they haven't even told us what those are. So this is a little premature talking about where the capillaries go but they're trying to put everything about renal circulation into uh, a couple of slides and uh, forgetting totally that they haven't even talked about this stuff. So I'm going to I'm going to jump down and show you these tubules, so this will make a little more sense. So here is an overview of the things we've been talking about. And we're going to drill down and talk uh, much more in detail about each of the individual pieces in a little bit. But sometimes it helps us step back and look at the whole thing all at one time. So here you have the uh, blood coming in, the afferent arteriole. Here's the wad of capillaries that makes up the glomerulus right here. And coming off of the glomerulus, look at these tubes. Look at these amazing, they call them convoluted tubules because they just twist and turn and go every which way. So there's your convoluted tubules. And here is the uh, loop of Henley. They're, they keep renaming stuff in this book, which absolutely makes me nuts. Uh, but anyway, if you talk with anybody who does anything with the kidneys, they'll talk about the loop of Henley. And they're trying to call it the nephron loop. So anyway, uh, just if you see the word nephron loop in your mind, go, oh, they mean the loop of Henley. So here you've got loops here, loops here convoluted tubules here and you're going to be needing blood supply around them so that's what they're talking about the paratubular paratubular around the tubes so that'll make a little bit more sense if you think about as you're pushing 
plasma through these tubules, you're going to be turning the plasma into urine. You're going to save the stuff that's good and return it to the body, and the stuff that you don't want anymore, like a lot of the nitrogen waste, you're going to, you're going to leave it in these tubules, and you're going to get rid of it. So you need some way of getting the stuff out of the tubes and returning it to the body. And that's where your paratubular capillaries come into play. And then again, they nourish all of this area too. They bring oxygen and food in and carry away uh, other waste. So in this slide, they do tell you that the nephron loop is actually the loop of Henley. So in that little bar of soap-sized kidney, you've got over a million nephrons. And each nephron is going to have two parts. One of them is called the renal corpuscle, and that's the one that's got the, the glomerulus in it. And then those tubules that I was showing you. You've got some that are short, and they barely make it out of the cortex. And then you've got some that are really long and they go all the way down into the medulla. So here's that picture, here's your cortex up here, and look, here's your medulla down here, and there's some of the tubules dropping down there. So each one of these is gonna have a slightly different function. This book is also renamed the Bowman's capsule into the glomerular capsule. So you're going to have to keep up with both of those. When they talk about the glomerular capsule, they're talking about Bowman's capsule. When they're talking about the uh, loop of Henley, they're going to call it the... In several chapters, when we're talking about things that have two layers, we call the outer layer the parietal layer, and the inner layer, the one that's closest to where the action is, we call that the visceral layer. So... In this uh, Bowman's capsule, you're going to have a parietal and a visceral layer. And inside the visceral layer is the glomerulus. All right, now we're going to just take this area right here, and we're just going to look at that. So that's what they're calling the renal corpuscle, but it is the Bowman's capsule. And here's the outer parietal layer out here, the parietal layer, and then there's the inner layer, which is the visceral layer, and the visceral layer has uh, slits in it called podocytes, so podo means foot, so if somebody was looking at this and said, oh look, that looks like little feet. Right there. Oh, we'll just call those podocytes. So the visceral layer has podocytes with these slits in it that allows plasma to leak out, but you do not want red blood cells to leak out. So coming in from the artery through the passageway all the way down to the afferent arteriole, you're bringing in blood and plasma. But as it pushes in, it comes into this capsule right here, and you're going to squeeze out the plasma while retaining the red blood cells in here. Now, if you look at the size of the afferent versus the size of the efferent, you see that this is much larger. So the blood coming in can come in at a faster rate because you have a larger lumen, a larger hole, a larger pipe to come in through. And then as it's going through here, it's trying to get out through the efferent arteriole, and that's going to be constricted as smaller. So you're going to build up pressure in here, and that's going to help push the plasma out. Once you push the plasma out through these podocytes or foot cells with the slits in them, it's going to go into what we call the proximal convoluted tubule. 
So one of the things that they say will help you to understand this is to take your uh, right hand and make a fist of your left hand and put your fist into your right hand and wrap your right hand around it as if you were holding a, a baseball and you have a glove on. So if you can visualize that, the glomerulus, this filtration unit here, this wad of capillaries that's leaking the plasma out would be your fist and then your catcher's mitt, your right hand, would be this Bowman's capsule. So try and imagine this as fingers of a fist right here. And then there's your catcher's mitt. And that might help you uh, visualize this renal corpuscle or the Bowman's capsule with the glomerulus inside. So the renal corpuscle is made up of the Bowman's capsule with the glomerulus inside. And then coming off of the glomerulus, you start out with your tubules. So you've got your proximal convoluted tubule. So if you say somebody is in close proximity to you, that's the f they're, they're very, very close to you. So the proximal convoluted tubule. This is why it's called convoluted, because look at those coils. So you have a proximal convoluted and you have a distal convoluted tubule. So distal uh, looks like distant, and it is. It's further away. This is where the processed urine is, is going to be leaving and exiting the body. So you have the proximal convoluted tubule, and then you're going to drop down into that loop of Henle, and then you're going to come back up to the distal convoluted tubule. So those are your parts of the tubule system. And then once you've gotten to the distal convoluted tubule, now you're going to go over into some collecting tubes that we talked about. If you remember us talking about cell types, when we talked about cuboidal epithelial cells, anytime you see square epithelium, you know that you're going to be doing either secretion or absorption. So in the proximal convoluted tubule, you're going to have simple cuboidal epithelium, and they're going to be little finger-like projections called microvilli on the surface of it so that you increase the surface area and you can absorb stuff. So the proximal convoluted tubule is going to be really important because we need to suck all the good stuff back up and send it back out in the body. You do not want it to be processed into urine. I keep popping back over to this slide because as we talk about various things, it helps to go back and look at the overall picture. So we're going to be talking about thin and thick layers of the, of the uh, loops of Henle. So you have thick and thin. It's hard to see the thin down here and the thick because they've put the uh, vasa recta around it. They put the blood vessels that are nourishing it around it. Those thick se segments are made of simple cuboidal epithelium. So again, you know you're either secreting something or absorbing something there. And uh, then you get into your thin segment, and it is simple squamous epithelium. So it is very, very, very thin. And this makes it very easy for water to pass through. So here's where you're going to... Uh, either get rid of water if you have a lot of blood pressure pushing it through or if you don't have a lot of blood pressure it's not going to push the water out and so you're going to retain your water so these the thin segments 
where you have the squamous epithelium is where you're going to be doing some water exchange. So here's another little flow sheet that should help people who like to see things stepwise so that they can see it in their mind. So after we leave the glomerular capsule or Bowman's capsule, because we've squirted out our plasma at that point into the, into the uh, Bowman's capsule, and we're going to send it to the proximal convoluted tubule. Remember, it's got those... Uh, cuboidal cells so you're going to be sucking good stuff out you, you know you don't want to get rid of it you want to put it back into the body and then you're going to drop down into the loop of Henley or which they call the nephron loop in this book so you're going to leave the capsule go through the proximal convoluted tubule suck out most of the goodies and then send the rest of the stuff that's waste and toxins and uh, a little bit of still some good stuff that we don't want to lose. It's going to go down into the nephron loop. So we're going to have to pull some more stuff out, which is why we still have cuboidal cells in there. After we make it through the loop, then we're going to go to the distal convoluted tubule. So imagine leaving the baseball glove and coming into this winding uh, tubule. A little tiny garden hose it's all wadded up and then it drops down into that u-shaped tube and it comes back out and it's all tangled up again or convoluted again so the one that's closest to the glomerular capsule that's closest to the glomerulus is going to be proximal and then the one after you finish going through the loop of Henley is going to be the distal tubule and now I'm going to start going through a series of collecting ducts papillary ducts, going to the minor calyx, the major calyx, dropping off into the renal pelvis, and then we're going to drop down through the ureter, into the bladder, and then out through the urethra. So here's your plumbing. Here's your, here's your tubes right here. So you can come back and go through this and make sure that you have it. But we'll go through it so many times, hopefully, that after we've gone through it a few times, you're like, okay, I got it, I got it. So here's what we call a triple exploded view. So you, you take the kidney and you say, okay, I'm just going to look at this one piece of the cortex and one of the pyramids of the medulla. So here's the little box right here. And we're just going to take this little piece right here. And we're going to blow it up right there. And then we're going to look just at the tubules within the pyramid and the cortex. So you notice that up here, hopefully you can see it on your, hopefully you're not using your phone to look at this video. Here is your glomerulus. And here is your proximal convoluted tubule. And there's your loop of Henley coming down. Coming back up, there's your distal convoluted tubule, and then there's your collecting ducts over there. So now we can explode that again and look at it, just this yellow part right there. So they're taking away, but they wanted you to see where it was situated within the kidney. And this could be repeated over here at this uh, pyramid, this pyramid, this pyramid. But they just took one of them as an example. But remember, you've got like 1.2 million of these little assemblies right here all right so this is the Bowman's capsule there's the glomerulus here's the incoming afferent there's the ex going ex, excuse me exiting efferent here is the proximal convoluted tubule there's the thick part the thin part of the loop of Henley Coming on up, thick part, and then there's the distal, the distant convoluted tubule, and then there's your collecting duct over there. So each of these is called a nephron. This whole setup with the glomerulus, the proximal, and the distal, and the loop of Henley, that is a nephron. 
Now, we're going to name these two kinds of nephrons separately because they're going to have a little bit different function, as I said. So these are called, are you ready for this word? Juxtamedullary nephrons. And these are called cortical nephrons. So that one's a little bit easier. But they stay almost exclusively in the cortex. They do their thing up here. But the juxtamedullary nephrons are the ones that are really interesting because they leave the cortex, they go down into the medulla, and then come back up to the cortex. And that's going to be hugely important. The other thing about the juxtamedullary nephrons is they're the ones that are going to be uh, doing hormone stuff, and they're going to be doing things with ions that these guys don't do. I spent about a fourth of my life overseas uh, working with our military and the Department of Defense. And one of the first things that they did, the first day I reported for duty, it was so funny, they gave me a manual and they said, here are all the abbreviations. What the government has done to save money is they've gotten rid of all of the vowels. And it was a joke. But you're going to find that they love to abbreviate things, and you're going, what the heck is that? So if you stop and see things like the PCT and the DCT, you're like, and you go, oh, proximal convoluted tubule and distal convoluted tubule. So because I spent so much time with the military, I can put in vowels and, uh, and figure out what all these little abbreviations are for. So about 15% of all the nephrons are going to be juxtamedullary. They're going to extend down into the medulla. Juxta means uh, next to. If you're juxtaposed, you're next to. So juxtamedullary are going to be next to or down into the medulla. So that's about 15%. And the other 85% pretty much just stay up in the cortex. So the these that are going to go down into the um, medulla are going to have to have the vasa recta to help them. And we need these to maintain the sodium in our body. We need it to maintain the sodium, especially in the medulla, so that we can do osmosis and cause the kidneys to work correctly. The nervous system obviously is important in regulating what the kidneys do. And you have sympathetic innervation. And if you remember sympathetic, that's what you do when you're in a, the grip of a strong emotion. So I always say f uh, fight or flight anytime I see the word sympathetic. So uh, let's say that you're scared, you're upset, something, you're going to not uh, make urine as well. You're going to shut it off. So you need to chill out so that your, your kidneys can work correctly. So, and I always love it. You think oh my gosh, we have to know everything there is to know about everything. There are so many things about our body that we do not understand, and we're constantly discovering amazing new stuff. So here we, we know that there's parasympathetic innervation because we can see the neurotransmitter, but they don't know what it's doing of unknown function. We talk about the sympathetic and the fight or the flight, and what springs to my mind is like, oh my goodness, my in-laws are coming over and my house is a mess. I don't have anything that's fancy to cook because we were just going to have fried bologna sandwiches. But there are other things that can cause sympathetic innervation. For example, a shark biting your leg off. So now you have falling blood pressure because you're bleeding out. And the last thing you need to do is to have your kidneys uh, secrete water and secrete um, stuff.
You, you need that, it just kind of to shut down so that you can redirect your blood flow to parts of your body that, you, that need it, like the brain, for example, or your muscles. So um, if your blood pressure starts falling, then you're going to stimulate the kidneys to secrete renin. So if you remember back when we did the hormone chapter, the endocrine system, we talked a little bit about renin, and we said we'll talk about it some more when we get into the uh, urogenital system or the urinary system. This is one of the most awful slides I have ever seen in my life. Whoever did it had no clue about how the kidney worked. But somebody said, make a flow chart showing that the blood comes in, is filtered out, the good stuff is absorbed back into the body, stuff that you don't want in your body, you can actually put into the tubules, and then you get rid of the stuff that you don't want as urine. But before you do that, you pull most of the water out. This is horrible because remember the glomerulus, this wad of capillaries in the Bowman's capsule, is has a proximal convoluted tubule, has a loop of Henle, has a distal convoluted tubule, and then it goes into the uh, collecting ducts. So they just make it into one straight tube, and and that's so wrong that it's just horrible. So when you see this, go, oh my gosh. Actually, it's good for learning because you can go through and go, well, that's wrong, and that's wrong, and that's wrong. But if you could cover up this right here and just go, you filter out in the glomerulus, you reabsorb in the tubes, and you secrete stuff that you want to get rid of into the tubes, you suck out the water, and then you send it on its way as urine, and ignore this. But this drawing is so unbelievably uh, misleading. It has no no connection to reality. They've taken they've taken all of this, all of this, and all of this, and just made it a straight line, which. Clearly, I mean, how in the world could you even pretend to do that? If you use your 40x objective on your microscope, you'll get a 400 time magnification of the kidney slice. And this is what you would see. Here's your Bowman's capsule, right here. Here's your glomerulus, which is just a wad of capillaries. And you can see the little red blood cells inside the capillaries. But to see what we need to see, we're going to have to use an electron microscope. And there's two kinds of electron microscopes. There is a scanning electron microscope where you can see the outside like this. So it's really cool because you can see the podocyte, the foot cell, and you can see those slits that are going to hold the red blood cells and the white blood cells and the platelets inside and not let them out. But you can squirt out the plasma along with the proteins and the sugars and all the other stuff that's in the plasma. And it'll squirt through those little uh, finger-like uh, slits in the podocytes. All right. And then if you want to get a little more information about the inside, what's going on inside, you're going to have to slice it and use a transmission electron microscope. And so here's a slice through right here. So it's, it's, this is so pretty and nice, and you get a lot of details and the slits and everything like that. But to get into the nitty-gritty about what's going on and see little pores and things like that, then you're going to need the transmission. But you, it, you have to take what you see under the light microscope with what you see under the electron microscope 
and put it all together. And that's where we get these little cartoon pictures because they're a little bit easier to see what's going on. So they've blown this one up. This is an erythrocyte right here. This is a red blood cell to give you a kind of a um, guide to what's going on. Here are those filtration slits. See those little slits right there? That's what these things are right here. But you've sliced a slice open so you can actually see inside there. So there's your filtration slits. And these are your endothelial cells. And there's your basement membrane. You guys remember what basement membrane has? Whenever you have endothelial or epithelial cells and you have the basement membrane under it, you're going to have mast cells with histamine. So keep that in mind. So here's kind of a table of things that can't get through the slit. They're too big to get through the slit and things that can get through the slit. So one of the things, if you want to keep your hormones, you don't want to get rid of the hormones, you want to keep them because you're going to be using them, you can attach the hormone to a large protein. And then this hormone protein, or if you have some minerals, you can also bind that to a protein. And once it comes to the slit, it's too big to get through. So where the mineral could easily pass through or the hormone could easily pass through if you, if you bind it to a, a protein like albumin, then it won't, it won't pass through. So um, these are the things that can't get through the slit and these are the things that can. Well, glucose, we need glucose. But unfortunately, it's small enough that it can easily go through the slit, and it ends up in the Bowman's capsule. And so it gets processed through, uh, to the loop. It gets towards the loop of Henley. So before it makes it out as urine, we're going to try and pull all the glucose out. And the body knows how much electrolytes it needs. So if you've been eating a lot of pretzels or something, a lot of salty peanuts, you've got way too much salt in your body. So you don't need all those electrolytes. So you're going to pull back what your body needs and you're going to let the rest go out with the urine. Amino acids, you need those. Those are the building blocks for proteins. So you want to pull those back in. So a lot of these things, the fatty acids, the vitamins, even a little bit of the urea, because you don't want to get rid of all of your nitrogen. Remember, you're going to be needing it for uh, amino acids. And you're going to be needing it for proteins. So, But you make way more than you need, so a lot of this will be passing out in the urine. If you lived a long time ago, you'd know that fenestrations are windows. So you've probably seen castles that have fenestrations, and that's where the archer would stand and shoot bows, uh, shoot arrows through. But yet it's, it's thin enough to where that they couldn't shoot arrows back in and hit the archer. So fenestrations are windows, and so they use it when they're talking about these capillaries. So you've got fenestrated capillaries. You've got slits in the capillaries. And this is going to allow all that stuff to come out that we were talking about in that other picture. So you're going to, um, red blood cells can't get through, white blood cells can't get through, platelets can't get through. So the formed elements can't make it through the fenestrations and those, um, those slits in the podocytes. So the podocytes wrap around the capillaries. So you're going to squirt it through the fenestrations of the capillaries, of the glomerular capillaries. Remember I said that wad that makes up the glomerulus is just actually a wad of capillaries. But there are specialized capillaries in that they're really leaky. And then because you've got these podocytes, these foot cells, wrapped around these capillaries, then they're also, they also have filtration slits. One of the things, this seems like a good place to throw it in, a lot of people take 
multivitamins and they take vitamin supplements they eat vitamin fortified foods and there are most vitamins are water soluble so these are the ones that would pass freely through that filtration they would they would make it through the fenestrations they would make it through the um, slits and the podocytes but um, there are some vitamins and there's four of them that are fat soluble so you need to be careful about taking in too much fat soluble vitamins because you do not pee them out so people who take a lot of vitamin C it's okay your kidneys will just secrete it you'll get rid of it in your urine so you get you it doesn't really matter how much vitamin C you take or how much B vitamins you take but the four that you need to be careful about that are fat soluble make up the letters of my last name um, Drake so my last name is Drake and vitamin D is fat soluble and you can build up toxic levels of vitamin D milk is fortified with D bread is fortified and then all your multi multivitamins and things that you take also have vitamin D in them but you can get too much of a good thing now there is no such thing as vitamin R and then the last of my name is A K and E and those are three more of your fat soluble vitamins so you will not pee out excess you will build it up and you can build it up to toxic levels in your body so be careful of the D A K E and don't take too much of those all right and uh, here are some of the things that they point out that are on the big plasma proteins so that you don't get rid of them you need to keep your calcium you need to keep your iron because you're going to be making hemoglobin and you need your thyroid hormone because that controls the metabolism of your body so that those are really important so they don't go through the slits and so you don't have to pull those back into the body they don't make it out uh, into the um, they don't make it out of Bowman's capsule they don't make it to the proximal or the distal convoluted tubules you, you just you keep them in your bloodstream so that's a good thing now when you consider that the Bowman's capsule and the um, uh, glomerulus are squamous epithelial cells they're very very thin they're one cell layer thick so it would be very easy to damage them because they're so thin so if you are playing tackle football for example and I've had students who played football and they'll come in and when they pee they pee blood obviously blood should never be able to come out of your kidneys uh, the the fenestration those slits are too small to allow blood so when you see blood coming out you know that something has damaged the glomeruli that's that's plural for glomerulus and so if you have protein coming out in your urine that's a sign that you've caused some damage to your kidneys now it doesn't have to be somebody tackling you in football you may have a kidney infection you may have a bladder infection so but the anytime you see blood in your urine or protein in your urine then you know that there's something wrong and you need to figure out what's going on so you may have to take an antibiotic uh, you may have to just stop you may have to play tag football or learn how to run faster so people don't tackle you so proteinuria is having protein in your urine and that's not okay and hemat excuse me hematuria is uh, having hemoglobin or blood in urine so that's not good so they're saying even people like distance runners if you think about every time your foot hits the ground it sends a shock wave through your body so and your kidneys are part of your body and even though they're sitting in there the little fatty uh, pad think about most of the distance runners that you've seen in the swimmers they don't have a lot of fat so they have dissolved away often a lot of their fat 
the pocket that holds her kidney up. So it, it is not uncommon for athletes to pee protein or pee blood, but it's not good. That's not good. So I mentioned that the tube coming in, the afferent arteriole, is larger than the efferent arteriole, so you're going to build up pressure inside the glomerulus. So this is going to cause filtration pressure. Too much filtration pressure can actually destroy the glomerulus. So uh, people that have chronic high blood pressure are damaging their kidneys. So I want to speak with you frankly about something. If you have high blood pressure, you're like, well, why don't you take a pill to lower your blood pressure? Well, there are a lot of men who won't take blood pressure medicine because if you stop and think about lowering your blood pressure, your, your erection is caused by blood pressure in the penis. And some people who take blood pressure medicines end up not being able to perform as well as they used to if you take my meaning. And so <clears throat> they decide, well, I'm not going to be taking that blood pressure medicine. But if you have chronic high blood pressure, then it can rupture your glomerular capillaries because you have way too much pressure in there. And it can scar. Instead of regrowing the squamous epithelial cells, it may just put scar tissue there. And now you've lost that nephron. Well, that's okay. You got 1.2 million in each side. So you can afford to lose a few of them and have scar tissue replacing them. But if you have chronic high blood pressure and you do not treat it, then you're going to be learn losing more and more of your nephrons. The other thing that you can do if you have high blood pressure is you get atherosclerosis of the blood vessels. So the sclerosis is a hardening. So you have the hardening of your arteries. And that will cause renal failure. So think about um, getting treated if you have high blood pressure. Most people feel like, oh, well, if I just don't eat salt, it's going to fix my blood pressure. Well, only people who can't pee out excess salt are going to be helped by cutting out salt. So it's kind of like those people who are uh, can't eat gluten. It's like 6% of the people, but they want everybody to stop eating gluten. And for all the people who have normal kidneys, they want them to stop eating salt. Well, if you have normal kidneys, you're going to be able to pee out the excess salt. So those who can't pee out the excess salt due to a hormone deficiency or genetic problem are causing all the restaurants to start cooking food without salt. And that makes me sad because there's some things you just can't add salt back to to make them taste any kind of good. You need to cook them with salt in it. So if your doctor says, well, stop eating salt, do it. Check it out. See if your blood pressure drops. If it does, that was your problem. You can't get rid of the salt, and the salt is causing your high blood pressure. But if you cut salt out of your diet and your blood pressure remains up, then it's something else is causing your high blood pressure. So you need to go figure out what it is that's causing it. And there are many different causes of, of high blood pressure or hypertension. But remember, high blood pressure is damaging your blood vessels, especially in your kidneys. I pulled up this table to show you glomerular filtration rate. And notice the little star right there. So they're not actually measuring the filtration rate of each of your glomeruli. What they do is they look and they see how much creatinine that you have in your blood. So if your kidneys are working correctly, you should be able to get rid of that creatinine. 
if you are unable to do so, then that's where they start rating you as having kidney disease. So your glomerular filtration rate of 90 or better is perfect. You're great. If you are below 60, then they say you now have a mild kidney function problem. You have loss of kidney function anywhere below 60. So 60 and above is great, and 60 below, not so good. So then you get into whether or not your kidneys are going to be able to clear your blood of enough toxic substances for you to be able to function. So as you drop the glomerular filtration rate, as you are unable to clean the blood of the toxic substances in it, then you may start having to have kidney dialysis where they literally run the blood out of your body into a machine and clean it in the machine and then return it to your body. So obviously that's no good. You have to do that several times a week depending on how bad your kidney function is. And then if it drops to a certain level, then you're actually going to have to have a kidney transplant because you can't function with with the filtration rate that your kidneys are doing. Now, this is the filtration rate of both kidneys. So here's your mathematical formula, the glomerular filtration rate, and they tell you how you look at your net filtration pressure and you use a coefficient, which I call a fudge factor. You just kind of throw this number in and multiply it and Boop, you end up with a male will process about 180 liters of blood. So you only have five or six liters of blood. So you're going to process it over and over and over and over, over again. And a woman has less blood. So she only processes about 150 liters a day. But of course, you know, that depends on how big the woman is, how small the guy is, how old they are, things like that, their body weight. Most all of the filtrate, 99% or more, is reabsorbed. So you only make anywhere from one to two liters of urine. Now, if you're diabetic, you can make a whole lot more. Diabetics tend to pee so much because they're passing the glucose out into their urine. And so the body is trying to get rid of that. And in order to do that, you lose a lot of fluid. So one of the, the key things, to, the, if you all of a sudden just start peeing all the time, you need to have your uh, blood checked to see if you're diabetic. But normally anywhere from one to two liters is how much that you pee every day. If for some reason your glomerular filtration rate that's estimated by your creatinine is off, then again, before you start thinking that your kidney's not working, look and see if there's a kink in the ureter. If your glomerular filtration rate or your GFR is too high, then the fluid that's squirted out, remember we talked about the uh, Bowman's capsule and the glomerulus and you're squeezing the plasma out. You, if you don't take time to process it, if it's going so fast through the proximal convoluted tubule and the loop of Henle and the distal convoluted tubule that you don't have a chance to absorb the good stuff you know, back into the body, then you're going to pee too much. So that's why they say your urine output rises and you can get dehydrated because you're peeing out more than you're drinking in or eating in your food and you don't have time to pull all the sodium and the potassium out that you need to keep your body going so you have electrolyte depletion so you don't want too fast of a glomerular filtration rate but if your glomerular filtration rate is too low then the the urine it's the plasma that's turning into urine stays in those tubules too long. And so you can have time to reabsorb waste. So you can actually poison your body. And remember that word azo? That's nitrogen. 
Those are nitrogen-containing compounds. So you may have too much nitrogen in your blood. So you, you need the glomerular filtration rate to be just right. And above 60 is a nice place to be. Now, if you're old, if you're young, if you're male, if you're female, and if you're African-American, you're going to have a different glomerular filtration rate. So when your doctor gives you your test results, they'll say this is normal for a woman, this is normal for an old person, this is normal for an African-American. And here are the three things that you can do to control your glomerular filtration rate. The kidney itself constantly is monitoring. Is there too much pressure? Is there not enough pressure? So it's constantly checking how much pressure that there is. And then we talked about the sympathetic control, which is if your blood pressure starts dropping, then you're going to slow down the glomerular filtration rate. And then you also have hormonal control. So we have renin, we have all sorts of other hormones that are going to be affecting the glomerular filtration rate. So you, the kidney itself can do it, the nervous system through sympathetic nervous control, and hormones. Three ways that you can control your glomerular filtration rate. So if you're looking at how the kidney itself regulates blood pressure, here's two auto regulation methods so auto means do it to yourself auto and myogenic means muscle so if you constrict or open up muscles in blood vessels you're going to decrease the blood pressure or increase the blood pressure so using muscles in the blood vessels is one way that you can regulate within the kidney and how's this one? Tubulo-glomerular feedback. So you're going to get information from the tubes. Remember, you have the uh, proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, and the distal convoluted tubule. All of those tubes and the glomerulus itself are going to send information to the body saying too much pressure, not enough pressure. If you remember when we talked about, say, the heart, or if you remember back when we did muscles and talked about smooth muscles, if your blood pressure increases, it's going to stretch smooth muscle. And if you stretch the smooth muscle, it tends to want to contract. It, it's just like a rubber band. Think about a rubber band. You stretch and stretch the rubber band, but it's trying really hard to contract. So if you let go of the rubber band, boom, it's going to um, go back and contract. So that's just myogenic is think about a rubber band and stretching it. So you're going to get more um, uh, urge to contract. All right. And if it contracts, then it's going to constrict. It's going to prevent the blood flow. So this that's one way that you can uh, regulate the uh, glomerular filtration rate. If your blood pressure falls, you are not stretching the smooth muscles that are in the arteries. And so the afferent arteriole relaxes. Remember, it's being fed by the arteries that are coming in, the renal arteries and the um, interlobar, lobar, that's so hard to say, interlobar artery and the arcuate artery and the cortical radiate arteries remember all those that are coming in and then they end up at the afferent arteriole so if you're not stretching it if you have low blood pressure then it's going to dilate it's going to open up and then you're going to allow more blood to flow so you end up with a higher blood pressure inside the kidney which is what you you need a little bit higher blood pressure in the kidney because you want to force the filtrate out and send it on its way through the loops to be cleaned up. There's a very elegant cascade effect that happens. I'm going to talk you through it, but you don't have to memorize this. I'll not test you over it. 
But if your glomerular filtration rate is really high, then you're not having the time to pull the salt out. So you've got more uh, sodium in your filtrate because you can't pull it out. It's going, it's going by too fast. Because there's more sodium chloride, you have some sensory cells in the loop, the nephron loop, which is the loop of Henle. And if you absorb salt, it causes those, those sensory cells to secrete ATP. There's your little energy cell, ATP. And as you break down the ATP, then you release the uh, adenosine. That's the A of ATP. The TP is three phosphates. Adenosine triphosphate. So as you're pulling the phosphates off and you're releasing the adenosine, then it's going to cause nearby cells, the granular cells, to uh, talk to the juxta glomerular apparatus and we're going to learn that the juxtaglomerular apparatus also has a cascade that it goes through and the end result is the smooth muscle cells constrict contract and they limit the GFR they slow it down because you need to be able to pull the sodium chloride out so these sensory cells that are in the tube, in this loop, the, the loop of Henle, are able to say, whoa, there's way too much salt here, and start this cascade, and slow the glomerular filtration right now. So like I said, you don't have to know the cascade, but be aware that if you're going too fast, you don't have a chance to pull the good stuff out, and it's going to cause effects within the tubules. So now we're adding layers of complexity to our picture of the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule. We're now talking about granular cells, and these can constrict. You see they're wrapped around, so they can constrict the afferent arterial, the incoming. So it slows down the amount of blood that enters the glomerulus, so you have time to process it. And then we talked about the, the uh, tubules. And so here is the, the uh, beginning of the loop of Henle, the nephron loop, as they call it. And there are specialized cells. See, they're different than the other cells. And those are the macula densa. And those are the ones that will absorb the sodium chloride and, and do the whole ATP cascade. So we're getting a little more complicated and the mesangial cells in there in between the uh, capillaries that make up the glomerulus. So that's what they were talking about, those also. And then you have the sympathetic innervation, so the nerves coming in and talking to the blood vessels. So you're getting more and more complicated. You're getting more and more factors affecting how the plasma is cleaned and how the urine is made. This slide's just repeating what we've already said before. If you have sympathetic nerve fibers that are firing, it's going to reduce your glomerular filtration rate. It is going to shut down your urine output. It's going to redirect the blood away from the kidney and send it to the heart and the brain and the skeletal muscles because you're going to need to do something, the fight or flight kind of thing. Here's a little bit of review going back to the circulatory system. And we talked about the baroreceptors or the pressure receptors that you have in your carotid artery and in your aorta. So if you have a drop in blood pressure, these pressure receptors, these baroreceptors, stimulate the sympathetic nervous system. And we talked about renin and angiotensin and aldosterone when we were doing the endocrine system. So renin will cause angiotensinogen to turn into angiotensin. 
Here we're tying in the liver, which made the angiotensinogen. The kidney, with this renin, will cleave it, will cut it down into a little 10 amino acid piece, which is angiotensin 1. And then the lungs have ACE enzyme, angiotensin converting enzyme, and it will take the angiotensin 1 and convert it into angiotensin 2. And remember, when we talked about the respiratory system, we talked about how ironic it was that the receptor for uh, ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme, is the receptor that the COVID virus, like or the coronavirus, likes to attach to, and so it can be pulled into the lung cells, and you end up with a, a case of COVID. So if we didn't need these receptors, then we would have no way for the, for the coronavirus to enter our body. But unfortunately, we have the receptors to do this, and so people who are really fat you tend to have high blood pressure, and so they tend to, to be more susceptible <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> to COVID and having a bad outcome from COVID. So you, all of our systems are interconnected. It's hard to talk about one without pulling in the other systems into it. So angiotensin 2 is going to stimulate the adrenal cortex to secrete aldosterone. So back to our endocrine chapter. And I do want you to remember aldosterone makes sodium and water be reabsorbed in the distal convoluted tubule and in the collecting duct. So this is going to help you if you have if you have low blood pressure and you secrete aldosterone you're going to pull more sodium in you're going to pour more water in and it's going to raise your blood pressure also your posterior pituitary will secrete antidiuretic hormone which causes more water to be reabsorbed by the collecting duct. And it tells you that you're thirsty. So this is going to bring your blood pressure up. I'm going to stop here, and we'll start with exactly how the tubules reabsorb solutes and make the urine in our next episode of Chapter 23, your analysis.